I think sometimes we make fantasy football a little bit too difficult. We overthink things, we outsmart ourselves, we assume regression will happen when it won't necessarily, we assume players who were sort of good last season are some suddenly going to be really good this season, we anticipate that rookies will be better than they are, and sometimes we just collectively create these ADPs and values that make me say, what the fuck is up? And I'm Noah Hills. You can find me on Twitter, at No More Parties. And this video is about three players, three running backs, who are being drafted significantly lower than where they finished last season in fantasy football, and who are great values right now. The first guy I want to talk about in this video is David Montgomery, who last season finished as the RB15 on a points per game basis and is currently being drafted as the RB20. Last year was a complete slog for him, really. He averaged 3.77 yards per carry, which among 50 running backs in the entire league who had at least 100 carries last season, Montgomery ranked 41st in raw yards per carry. He was not good on the ground, not efficient at all, and he was even inefficient in the context of the Bears' offense. The Bears did not have a good offense. Montgomery was bad even in the context of that. He averaged 0.4 yards per carry fewer than other Bears running backs collectively averaged, which is in the 37th percentile going back to 2016, and was the first time in his career that he was less efficient than his teammates despite seeing lighter box counts than those guys did. This wasn't even a situation where he was like, churning out like you know positive plays with low ceiling output he wasn't even doing that like he was he succeeded on his carries given the box counts that he was seeing relative to his teammates seven percent less often than other bears running backs a relative success rate in the 20th percentile so he was very inconsistent or i mean he really wasn't inconsistent he was consistently bad on a per carry basis and his overall efficiency was low as a result he just was not good as a ball carrier last season However, he finished as the RB15 while being a terrible runner on a Bears offense with a rookie quarterback that finished 24th in the NFL in yards and 27th in the NFL in points. One of the worst offenses in the league, incredibly low efficiency, and he was still nearly an RB1. And I think a lot of that inefficiency can be blamed on a knee injury that he suffered in week four. In weeks one through four, that first beginning part of the season, Montgomery averaged 4.48 yards per carry, and then he missed a few weeks, came back in week nine, and from then on through the rest of the season, he averaged 3.46 yards per carry. His, his per carry average dropped by more than a yard. That's massive. But during that second half of the season, Season, he produced as the RB10 on a per game basis. Like he was even better in the second half of the season, given the volume that he saw and things like that, than he was early on before getting hurt, at least in fantasy points per game. Much worse on a per carry basis, but more productive in fantasy, despite being terrible on a per carry basis. And so he obviously doesn't need to be on a great offense to produce. He obviously doesn't need incredible efficiency to produce. He doesn't even need good efficiency to produce. And then, you know, there's this issue of Khalil Herbert. What about Khalil Herbert? He was great last year. He's probably an awesome handcuff in, you know, the same vein as like Alexander Madison, dudes like that who are going to be, you know, plug and play into your RB2 spot if Montgomery misses any time. But I don't think he's an actual threat to Montgomery's workload, even given how good he was last season. From weeks five through eight last season, when David Montgomery was out with injury, Khalil Herbert stepped in and they absolutely fed him. He averaged 22 opportunities per game during that stretch. That's carries plus targets. Like the man was a workhorse. And during that time, he averaged 13.5 points per game, which is like right in, you know, the decent RB2 range. But on his, his rushing workload over the course of the season, his box adjusted efficiency rating and his relative success rate, which is like team relative efficiency and then team relative consistency on the ground, how, how productive, how efficient is he on a per carry basis relative to his teammates both of those numbers were in the 70th and 72nd percentiles he was one of the one of the most dynamic runners in the league especially one of the most dynamic second guys in the league number two running backs he was really good last year as a ball carrier and was productive when david montgomery missed time when david montgomery came back weeks 9 through 18 Khalil Herbert averaged 3.1 opportunities per game. Despite David Montgomery playing really badly on like a per carry basis, doing almost nothing with his carries, less than three and a half yards per carry during that stretch, after Khalil Herbert was really good in Montgomery's absence, they didn't look at this as a situation where like, oh man, we need to make this more of a split, we need to get Herbert involved. It was just Montgomery was the workhorse again, and Herbert went back to the bench. In this offseason, running back coach David Walker in Chicago said, this is a quote, 
I expect him to be able to go out there, in reference to Khalil Herbert, I expect him to be able to go out there. If Demo is on the sideline and he has to be in the game, he will do a good job as well as he did last year. That doesn't really sound like a guy who's like in line for some increased opportunity this season. If he has to be in the game, he will do a good job. That says to me like this guy's a handcuff. He's going to get a couple opportunities per game, just like he did towards the end of last year. But this is David Montgomery's backfield. And so last year, David Montgomery had an 80% opportunity share. That was number four in the league. The year before, he had a 90% opportunity share. That was number one in the league. Let's say we bake in some, you know, drop in that. Let's say Herbert gets a few more opportunities, a few more carries per game. Montgomery gets a little bit of a break every once in a while. Let's let's say his opportunity share dips to 65%. That would be a massive drop off from where he's been the last two years. But let's say it drops to 65%. That would make it 13th in the league based on numbers from last season. If we took like, what is that, 15%? And if we decreased his fantasy points based on those percentages, that would give him 12.2 points per game based on what he did last season and a 65% opportunity share instead of 80. 12.2 points per game would have made him last season's RB23. And that's baking in no improvement in either his individual efficiency or the Bears' offensive productivity at all. Like, Justin Fields doesn't take any steps forward. They're the same terrible offense. Montgomery has the same terrible per carry efficiency, but he gets a lesser workload. 65% workload, RB23. He's currently being drafted as the RB20. That's his floor. I don't see that happening. I think Montgomery, if healthy, is still a mid-solid RB2 that you can get as a back-end RB2. The next guy I want to talk about is Leonard Fournette, who I talked about a little bit in my uh, video earlier this week, where I, you know, kind of talked about Rashad White and his upside as a potential league-winning running back towards the later half of the season, and I believe that's true, but I also still think that Leonard Fournette is a value right now. Last season, he finished as the RB4. He's currently being drafted as the RB12. And the assumption there has got to be either A, that the Bucks are going to get, like, worse on offense, or B, that Fournette is going to lose a lot of work from what he had last season. Last season's RB12, given that Fournette is currently being drafted as the RB12, last season's RB12 was Aaron Jones, who scored 83.6% of Fournette's points per game. So Fournette's points per game, Aaron Jones scored just under 84% of that. With the same workload that Fournette had last year, in order to score the same amount of points per game that Aaron Jones had, so in order to lose, what is that? In order to lose almost 17 points per game from last season's fantasy scoring for Leonard Fournette, with the same workload that he had last year, so he's not losing any work, how much would the Bucks have to, like, get worse on offense? They would have to lose 84 points from their season total from last season. They would have to lose 1,132 yards from their overall, like, offensive yardage output, which would bring them from 2nd in points to 13th in points, and would bring them from 2nd in yards to 19th in yards. I don't think the Bucks are going to suddenly become, like, a completely average offense, and so Leonard Fournette becoming the RB12 is probably not going to happen via the Bucks like getting worse on offense because they'd have to get so much worse on offense that it's just unrealistic that it's not going to happen. Scenario B is that Fournette loses more work. And in that scenario, that probably means that like Rashad White is at the very least a one-to-one -one replacement for Ronald Jones in the rushing department and that Rashad White takes on, you know, some sort of large, sizable receiving load out of what Leonard Fournette had last season. Last year, Ronald Jones had 101 rushing attempts. Rashad White would have to step in and pretty much replicate that. And in order to get to where Aaron Jones was scoring last year on a per-game basis, Rashad White would also have to take like a third of Leonard Fournette's receiving role. Those lost points would equal 15.25 points per game is what Fournette would end up with, which would be 0 0.02 points per game behind where Aaron Jones was last year. So if Rashad White comes in and gets the exact same rushing workload that Ronald Jones had, plus he steals a third of Fournette's receiving role, then Fournette could finish as the RB12. I don't think that's impossible. I don't know that it's likely. I think it kind of assumes that Rashad White gets in the field immediately. I don't know if that happens. Can he pass block? Will they trust him to protect Tom Brady? Will they, you know, trust him to execute his assignments properly in the passing game and, you know, pick the right holes? Like, the burden of proof for Rashad White to get on the field early, I think, is fairly high given that this is a competing team with a quality veteran quarterback who needs players he trusts on the field. Is Rashad White going to be that immediately? I don't know. And so while I think there's a room for a dip in the receiving role for Leonard Fournette, he was one of the most heavily used receiving running backs last year across the entire league. So while I think there's probably room in Fournette's receiving role to take a little bit of a step back, given that he was one of the most like heavily involved receivers among running backs in the league last year, I also think that his overall role leaves a little bit of room for growth. He was 12th in the league in snap share, 11th in the league in opportunity share. The Bucks trust him to pass block. They trust him to execute his assignments properly with Tom Brady back there. 
And so unless he's completely ineffective, like in, you know, these this 260-pound weight thing ends up mattering, he's just like out of shape, or he shows up and doesn't give a shit, and he just sucks, unless that happens, I think he's a pretty safe pick with fairly insulated opportunity, given that Rashad White, at least early on, is probably not going to be super involved, and Leonard Fournette wasn't that overworked last year. His, his workload was fairly you know, towards average among running backs league-wide. He can withstand a dip in offensive production quite easily. He can withstand a dip in his workload, and I don't even know that that's likely to happen. And I think he can withstand, like, splitting the difference on both. This doesn't have to be an either-or situation. It can be an and. The bucks get a little bit worse. His roll decreases a little bit. And he could still be a fine pick at ADP. The last guy I want to talk about is Alvin Kamara, who last season finished as the RB5 and is currently being drafted as the RB15. And really the only issue here is the potential suspension from the incident in February where he allegedly like punched a guy in a bar or something like that. He has a hearing for this on August 1st, which has been pushed back twice based on paperwork or, you know, whatever. Could be pushed back again. Even if it happens, could be more time afterwards for the league to make their decision. He could be in the lineup week one. He could miss six weeks. He could miss time in the middle of the season. Could be nothing. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a fortune teller. And we might even know what's going on in the situation like by the time you draft in your home league or whatever. But right now, I think the situation is really just about risk tolerance. And I'd argue the risk isn't even that great. Let's just say Alvin Kamara misses six games. He misses week one through week six. You're not taking a zero in your lineup when Kamara's, you know, unavailable to start for you. You're not just taking a zero in that spot. Let's say you pick up a dude off waivers and he gives you just replacement level production. He he scores the same points per game for you. You get the same production in that spot as like the 100th ranked flex player from last season. That would be like Hunter Henry, Ramondre Stevenson, Alan Lazard level production, just under 10 points per game. Let's say you can you can stream 10 points per game off of the waiver wire in Kamara's spot while he's gone. Let's say you get 11 games of Kamara plus six games of like 10-ish points per game. Over the course of the season, if that was one player, that's 15.01 points per game based on what Kamara scored last year and what the 100th ranked flex player scored last year. 15.01 points per game would be good for last season's RB13. Kamara is currently being drafted as the RB15. I look at this situation very similarly to how I view the Ezekiel Elliott situation back when he was suspended the first few games in 2017. He missed the first six games that year. He came back and produced as the RB3 on a points per game basis. And once he was in their lineup, nobody who drafted him gave a fuck that he missed the first few games of the season. It's like he gave you a, a few duds or something, averaging 10 or 11 points per game while you just plug in whoever you have in his spot. And then he comes back and he's elite. Alvin Kamara is going to come back and be elite and you will have just plugged in whatever you have in place. And all of this ignores that there's like possible offensive improvement in New Orleans this year. Last season, they finished 19th in the league in points. They finished 28th in the league in yards. Alvin Kamara was like super inefficient, 3.69 yards per carry. His team relative stats were really good. 72nd percentile box adjusted efficiency rating, 70th percentile relative success rate. I don't think his inefficiency was due to him taking a step back. The offense was just bad and it led to bad per carry output given that he was playing on a bad team. They drafted Trevor Penning in the first round. He's a he's a first round offensive tackle. He could provide a little bit of help in the blocking department. Last year, the leading target getters in New Orleans, other than Kamara, were Marquez Callaway, Deontay Harris, and Traquan Smith. Those guys are their asses are on the bench now. And now it's first round rookie Chris Olave. It's Jarvis Landry. And maybe it's Michael Thomas. Like, this receiving core has been completely transformed in the offseason to where Jameis Winston's going to have, like, some legitimate weapons on the outside. The offensive line could be a little bit better. I think it's very likely that they're at least a little bit better of an offense than they were last season, which only helps Kamara whenever he comes back from suspension or if he just doesn't get one at all. And I think those are the two most likely outcomes. Number one, there's no suspension, and you rock with Kamara all year. Number two, you tread water with some random flex level guy for the first six games, and then you plug Kamara into your lineup in week seven, like Bill Murray showing up at the end of Space Jam to help the Toon Squad beat the Monstars.